Some of us had the uh, very fortunate experience to hear from David uh, when he presented a workshop on what it is that he's about to talk about today in this session, the Safe and Together uh, model. Uh, David has worked in the domestic violence field for 25 years. His training and consulting focuses on improving systemic responses to domestic violence when children are involved and also on responsible fatherhood. His organisation developed the Safe and Together model to improve case practice and cross-system collaboration in domestic violence cases involving children. David and his colleagues consult to US child welfare systems in a number of states. This includes overseeing a statewide network of domestic violence consultants for the Connecticut Department of Children and Families, training child welfare and co-located domestic violence advocates in Florida, facilitating collaboration between child welfare and domestic violence advocates in Colorado and developing a certified Safe and Together trainer network in all 88 Ohio country, um, county child welfare agencies. David has also done an enormous work in the court context in the area of child protection. Before I invite him to speak, I, of course, um, want to remind you, and I'm sure it's, I'm speaking to a well-informed audience on this subject, that although David's talking about child protection in our family law world today, we are, we are living in a child protection world. The uh, um, amendments to the Family Law Act, which began in 2006, uh, with their requirement for uh, families to attend um, family dispute resolution before going to court to resolve their issues, has really put us in the situation now where the core business of the family court when it comes to children's matters are matters that have a child protection aspect. There's a very high percentage of matters that involve family violence. The la last year's annual report from the family court identified that 69% of matters referred to to case assessment conferences involve family violence. Other issues which are very prevalent are drug and alcohol abuse, mental health issues and child abuse, and there's more than 50% of the cases that go to child assessment conferences involve three or more of those issues. So when you hear David talking about the child protection context, where what he has to say applies just as much to the work that's done in the family law courts as it does in um, the child protection jurisdiction. I'd like to welcome David. Thank you. Good morning. I um, want to thank um, Julie and Legal Aid for inviting me to be here. Um, I also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land before I start my presentation. Um, I um, was forced to travel to Perth in, uh, in the summertime, leaving th three feet of snow, a meter of snow at home. Um, so this has been a very difficult trip. Uh, my wife came with me. We had to go to Margaret River for a few days in Ratness Island. Um, so uh, it's, it's been quite difficult, and, and uh, folks at home have been sending us pictures of snow and cars buried under snow, so I'm quite relieved to be here. And... Uh, um, in this environment and get to talk to you. It's a real honor to be here and talk about the intersection of domestic violence and children exposed to domestic violence perpetrators' behavior. And um, as, as Julie included in her introduction, we really do very extensive training all over the U.S. and now doing more international work. Um, I had the opportunity to go to Queensland and Victoria in November and do um, about five days of training there for child protection and domestic violence sector folks some attorneys, and family services workers. So I've been getting more and more acclimated and familiar with the, the Australian context. And I know that WA is a little bit different in some ways than some of the other states. And um, Julie's briefed me on the changes in the family law um, that's happened recently. And I'm really going to try to tie that in. Um, my hope is that um, I will have about 10 minutes at the end, 15 minutes to take questions. So I really want to engage folks. So I'm going to move quickly through the, some of the material. And um, what you're seeing, I'm going to try to hit the high points of what we often spend days doing and trying to give you a feel of its implications uh, for the Safe and Together model for, for your work. Um, domestic violence cases, uh, in most contexts, my experience at this point is I think I hear from attorneys in, in different settings. I hear from child protection workers. I hear from social workers that domestic violence cases involving children are often the most challenging and frustrating cases that they face. Um, one extreme example of that I heard from a child protection manager in the U.S. 
that I've been working with for a number of years, um, that she said, I would take 10 sex abuse cases over one domestic violence case. And that's giving you an example of the extreme feelings and reactions these cases produce. But they often produce, at other levels, a lot of fear, uh, a lot of concern for the safety of the children, obviously, the safety for the adult survivor, uh, confusion about what's going on, who's responsible, um, difficulties in identifying the impact on the children. And one of the nice things about the current context for family law here is that there's a, a much broader uh, nexus being identified between the domestic violence and the child maltreatment with a change in the law. And I think that really dovetails really nicely with the Safe and Together model, uh, which we refer to as a perpetrator pattern-based approach. And there's a, there's a longer way to d describe that, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But where you're going to hear me talk about as I talk about the Safe and Together model and its principles and critical components is that, um, that when we look at that nexus between uh, domestic violence perpetrators' behavior and the impact on kids, we really need to start with the perpetrator's behavior pattern. So what I'm going to talk about is a very fact-based approach. It's a very behavioral approach in, a, in many different aspects. But that when we look at it, that um, the, the nexus has been commonly defined as did the kids see it, hear it, were they physically harmed by the domestic violence or were they in danger of being physically harmed, at least in the U.S. context. That's often where the conversation starts and stops around domestic violence and kids. And the truth is, and, and I think folks in the room know this, that, that what domestic violence perpetrators do uh, to harm children and the actions they take are much uh, wider, uh, in some ways I want to say comprehensive, much more um, uh, extensive. And, and what I mean by that is if we look at an incident-based approach, we're often missing in that focus on the physical violence much of what domestic violence perpetrators do, particularly over time, to create harm for kids and disrupt the family environment. And that we often struggle, and I, and I caught the end of the, the fetal alcohol syndrome talk, we often struggle to make the connection between um, domestic violence perpetrators' behavior and substance abuse in the family, for instance, or housing instability or medical neglect issues. And that often those... Um, the responsibility of that perpetrator for crazy, creating housing instability, let's say, family moving around multiple times, is obscured by the lack of focus on the perpetrator's pattern and an incident-based approach to looking at the issue. And so I'm going to offer you as a perpetrator pattern-based approach. I'm going to talk about the impact on kids. I'm going to talk about how we use the, the model and its critical components to shape documentation, which is particularly important in a legal setting, obviously. And I'll talk about some markers of systems change. Um, what I want to offer you is this, um, this framework here, which is how do we increase our identification of family violence while maintaining a child-centered response? One of the things that systems, I think family law, very much so, um, child protection for certain, and criminal court without their awareness mostly, to be honest, has struggled with is what's the connection between domestic violence and kids and, and I said before, we've done a poor job defining the connection, the nexus between the two. And part of it is we've defined the issue around relationship oftentimes. And we've seen it as relationship-based. And what I mean by that is we often start our conversations with questions like, well, when is she going to leave him? When is she going to understand what's going on? When is she going to make different choices? And built into that question and that uh, line of approach to the situation is an implicit belief, an erroneous one, by the way, that it's a relationship-based issue versus a perpetrator pattern-based issue. And, and for, for simplicity's sake, I'll offer up how we think about pedophiles as a more perpetrator pattern-based approach to issues in terms of abuse. We don't look at pedophiles and incest through, primarily through a relationship of, of the, a lens of the relationship. We often think about who is he perpetrated against, who is she perpetrated against, what's their pattern. We don't assume that we know their relationship, therefore we know the extent of risk to these kids or other kids. We really have to think about behaviors. And, and so what happens is when we look at domestic violence, whenever we start with that question, when is she going to leave him? When is she going to make the better decision? When is she going to pick the kids over him? That we're really implicitly making um, or approaching the issue from the wrong perspective. Because it implies that with the ending of the relationship, it automatically equals safety for the kids. 
And unfortunately, in the U.S. context, I know it's true here and other places, we've had too many examples of post-separation violence, homicide, familicide, death of children, murders, and, and, and that's at the extreme level. But we all know in the family court, you're very aware of this, the ongoing use of children and the family court process oftentimes to continue the abuse. And in fact, often the separation or the dissolution of the relationship opens up opportunities for that perpetrator to use the kids that weren't even available before because now they're often getting unsupervised access to those children. So we want to shift away. So you want to keep a child-centered perspective, um, and that means dropping what uh, we may have focused on in terms of relationship and really think about perpetrators' patterns. We really want to think about what perpetrators do and how they directly involve and target children. Uh, we want to do this, this better identification, without rebounding the greater attention, the greater understanding back on the adult survivor of domestic violence. And what we've seen in the U.S. context, and here with the widening of the definition of the Family Law Act to, be, to look at psychological abuse and neglect particularly, um, one of the dangers is it's going to be identified, uh, not the dangers, one of the things that's going to happen is to be identified more, and Julie's pointed to that earlier, but that in doing that, what's going to happen is it's going to increase the focus and the blame on the domestic violence victim, not on the perpetrator. And so what we've seen in the U.S. context and the child protection around the world really is the more that we've looked at domestic violence as being negatively impactful to children without increasing our capacity to deal with the perpetrator, uh, what we've ended up doing is actually creating greater pressure and uh, to some degree greater re-victimization of the adult domestic violence survivor. And that, at the bottom of it, doesn't serve children. Uh, we're often in a better position to serve children when we can create better alliances and partnerships with that non-offending parent with a domestic violence survivor. And so what we're looking to do is increase our identification, maintain a child-centered response, not allow that increased identification to rebound against the adult survivors, and support the capacity um, of professionals to work more effectively with domestic violence perpetrators. Um, I do, uh, and I don't know if I can do it here, I do a very high-tech visual aid. I did it yesterday. I'll do it here. I don't want to leave you out um, from doing it. It's, it's, it's been years in development. It looks something like this. You can see that a lot of work went into this. <laughs> it took a long time for me to put this together. Can you still hear me in the back over there? Okay. And what this represents right now is that we've increased our, our awareness around how domestic violence harms kids. That's happened over the last 10, 15, 20 years, depending on how you address it. And it's been the result of family violence advocates, uh, family violence researchers, children's advocates, a whole mess of folks who really said, look at how domestic violence harms kids. And in fact, we know at certain age groups, and there's data out of the U.S. that says that domestic violence is the leading uh, cause of, a, of a trauma and abuse and neglect impact on kids at certain ages, more than other things. And what we've done is said this is really important when we talk about kids and child service system, but down here, what this represents is our capacity to deal with perpetrators, to understand their behavior patterns, to document their behavior patterns, to understand their connection between their behaviors and their impact on the kids. And you may have noticed that I started out trying to say not how domestic violence harms kids, but I talked about how domestic violence perpetrators' behaviors harm children. That's part of the Safer Together model approach, which is you shift your language because it's not the weather. Domestic violence isn't the weather. It doesn't just happen. And in fact, it's not co-created. And, and that may be the hardest point for, for some folks to, to sort of go with me around. It's not co-created. Domestic violence perpetrators choose their actions or a series of choices they make. Their choices are parenting choices. I'll talk about what that means even when it's directed at the adult survivor. It's a parenting choice still. And what this left hand means is that We've gotten more concerned about how domestic violence harms kids, but we haven't gotten much better at dealing with perpetrators in document describing. So guess what's happened? The focus of this has really ended up on the domestic violence survivor and the child protection. I'm going to stop that because that's, that was going on for a long time. <laughs> I did work out already. When I, when I, when I um, don't work out, I usually do that for longer, but today I worked out, so I really um, that was about enough. Um, in the child protection framework, what you, what you see has happened is, is this incredible emphasis on a failure to protect framework. And that failure to protect framework really penalizes the domestic violence survivor for the choices made by the perpetrator. 
Now, I am not minimizing, I don't want anybody to hear that I'm minimizing the impact of domestic violence perpetrator behavior on children and the concern we should have about it. Absolutely not. But I want to be clear that when we're talking about this practice, we're really talking about, I'm going to go to this slide, what we're really talking about is a framework where it's the domestic violence perpetrator's behavior, not the victim's behavior, that creates the safety and risk harm to children. And, and for me, this is a fundamental foundation of, of domestic violence-informed child welfare practice, domestic violence-informed child serving practice. And that doesn't mean that a domestic violence victim may not also be a drug abuser, may not also be hit, hurting their kids, may not have their own issues um, that they're dealing with around temper or other things. But what it means is that the foundation of this work is seeing um, perpetrators as making choices and being responsible 100% for their choice and the consequences that flow from them. Um, what's not included in the bio is I spent 20 years running perpetrator intervention groups, men's behavior change groups in, in the U.S. And one of the lessons I brought from that is if you don't hold this perspective, if you don't see perpetrators as being 100% responsible for a choice to be violent, regardless if she's doing drugs, regardless if she's cheating, regardless if she's leaving the kids alone, I'm not minimizing, again, any of those things, that if you can't separate out those things from the choice of the other person to get violent, then you will become, and, and this is what we struggle with running those groups, you will often become a pawn or a supporter of that perpetrator around their violence. It, to my mind, it's that clear. A colleague of mine who ran a perpetrator's program in Vermont said to him, it was the day he realized he could be very effective with his population when he said, there's nothing he can say to me that will make me believe it was okay for him to get, get violent with his partner. And this is a point of self-reflection, really. I, I, I ask people to consider this, which is that what we're saying is, yes, she actually may be cheating. Yes, she may actually be doing drugs. What do you believe about your client or that person's choice to get violent? Are you able to say to them, it doesn't matter? doesn't matter. When it comes to your decision as a parent, you're 100% responsible for the fact that you grabbed her when you walked in and you found her doing drugs again. Or I had a client who actually was um, um, beat up his wife because she was smoking a cigarette while she was pregnant and she lied to him about it and he was concerned about the damage the smoking the cigarette would do to the baby. I'm serious. And so you may be sitting here saying, yeah, smoking is bad for, 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 for an unborn child. I mean, we might agree about it. Or she's drinking while she's pregnant. Let's make it that. But we have to be crystal clear that even if she was doing something that was harmful, what did his behavior do to actually make the situation better? And it's something you literally could say to a client or say to somebody. How did you being assaultive to your partner because you found them doing drugs, how did that increase the safety and well-being of the child? But even beyond that ability to engage around that conversation, really the clarity which is that person's 100% responsible for that choice to get violent, and that's a parenting choice. And we're going to move into a little bit around gender in a moment, and I'm going to talk about the language I use. But I really want to be clear that this is the foundation of the, the work we're doing and really what shifts practice. Um, and so what you see here is, is um, what we're, we're working towards is an expanded definition around the intersection of domestic violence and kids and a movement away from what appears to have been a relationship-based focus, which I gave an example before, which is, is she going to stay, is she going to leave, becoming a proxy for child safety? Um, and that when we look at perpetrator pattern-based assessment and thinking about this, we're not looking at this person's behavior just in this relationship. We're looking at it beyond, beyond this relationship. If he punched another woman in a previous relationship, you want to ask yourself, What's the relevancy of that to my case today? In our assessment of the safety of the kids or decisions the court needs to make, what's the relevance of the history? You're not assessing the relationship. You're assessing a person who's been violent and their behavior pattern. And the other big thing to really think about, and we struggle with this in the field, which is the domestic violence, family, family abuse work has really drawn out primarily from the violence against women field. And a lot of focus has been on that this is an adult-to-adult -adult issue. And even the language of it's an intimate partner violence issue really kind of reinforces that. And really what we're trying to move into with this model is that domestic violence perpetrators directly or indirectly involve their kids almost all the time. 
and that when, when he targets her and makes her, her world smaller, he's often making the children's world smaller. If you think about the classic example of, of jealousy and obsessive control that often involves maybe cutting somebody else's contact off from the outside world, stopping her from seeing family, friends, maybe getting a job. One of the things you could ask yourself is when, that, when that's directed at the adult partner, what's the consequence for the kids? What's the consequence for the kids if he stops his partner from working? What's the consequence for the kids if he gets violent and loses his job? What does that mean for the children? What happens when his violence leads to the family being uprooted, uprooted multiple times because she flees from the violence, he goes and finds them, brings them back, she moves again, he moves them to get them away from the, the landlord evicts them or the neighbors who call the police. And so the domestic violence perpetrator's behavior is, is the cause of multiple moves. And what we end up seeing is housing instability. And what we see is a family that hasn't been staying in one place for very long. Um, one of the examples we use out of case out of the U.S. is um, very classic jealousy, obsession, control. Um, grilled her whenever she went out alone. Whenever they were out together, he really uh, expected her to look down. When um, other, other men looked at her, he blamed her for what happened. And so what ended up happening was that it became just too much work for her to go out of the house. It just was just, he was just making it too hard. He would assault her. He would wear her down. The family had young kids. They lived across the street from a playscape, a playground. And so what happened is as we got involved with the case, we found out as, as she got less motivated it to go out, guess what happened? She stopped taking the kids to the playground. I don't believe he consciously targeted keeping his kids from the playground. I don't think that was the purpose of his behavior. But I think within the context of the work we're doing, it's very reasonable to talk to him about how his treatment of her was, in essence, a parenting choice because it impacted the children. And to really see that in that way is very important to see the evolution of this work and the moving forward of it. So what we're doing is looking at both behavior beyond the relationship, looking at beyond just the physical abuse, looking more than incidents, and we're looking at how this includes the kids. And so that really means... What does he do to undermine the other person's parenting? What does he do to interfere with her parenting? Has he used the kids as a weapon against the other person? One of the ways we can think beyond the incident-based focus is that if somebody gets violent and may get arrested and they talk to their kids after the fact, how do they talk to them about the violence? Do they, do they walk to their, up to their kids and say, you know what, daddy was wrong? Or do they say something like, Daddy loves you very much, and as soon as Mommy lets me come back home, I'll come home. Is that part of the pattern? I would offer it is. He's not doing anything arrestable. He may not be even violating an order. But we see it as a lack of responsibility, a use of the children. So this is how we begin to expand our thinking beyond it's just an incident-based focus and it's just about the physical violence. Because what we know about domestic violence perpetrators, isn't, that isn't what they do. And in fact, that's not what most of what they do. A lot of what they do is the psychological abuse, the manipulation, bribing kids, giving the 16-year-old girl the, the support money instead of giving it directly to the parent. So it shifts the power relationship between the two. Using visits to take the kid's medication and throw it out. And then telling the kids horrible things so they go home, wound up, agitated, upset. And then when people see the mom with the kids, what they see is a mother who can't take care of her kids, not the person who wound them up on the visit and sent them back home with no clothes or gets rid of the clothes that they were given for the visit and sends them home with dirty clothes. And what happens because of expectations around gender is she gets held responsible by Department of Child Protection or other folks for not caring for her kids. And so when we look at a perpetrator-based approach, we really kind of pull these things together and we really want to look at this wider understanding, this wider understanding of the pathways to harm. Um, this is one of the slides I encourage you to come back to after the talk, because it really um, lays out for you the multiple pathways by which perpetrators harm kids. And it's uh, what we most often focus on is the trauma part. And what we are frequently dealing with, though, is also the effects on her parenting and the effects on the family ecology. And we've effectively uh, 
not told the story in many of these cases, which means when I say this, it's not only what's in front of you, but the documentation that may be brought to you or the, or the, the information from DCP is going to be missing this. And when we do the training and we do lengthier work with folks, what we find out is this information is often known by people but not put together. Yesterday we did some training elements. We had a group, I think DCP was probably 25, 30 people in the room yesterday. Great representation, by the way. Uh, we're very excited about this model. They're already asking for me to come back and do more training for them. But one of the things they said as we, as we, did, this, as we did this work is they said, um, I realized I knew more about the family. I knew more about the perpetrator's pattern. I knew more about the mother's strengths than I realized. And what that translates to is they knew things they weren't writing down. So what I would encourage you to do on a very practical level is, is you kind of think about this and you, and you leave here today and you work with families is to think about what am I asking? What do people know? What do the professionals know if, if, if DCP is involved? I'm able to ask them questions about what's the perpetrator's pattern. And, and don't be afraid to just use that language. Well, what do you know about the perpetrator's pattern of behavior towards mom, towards the kids, and prior relationships? If that's something you just take away and use, that's fine. If you, if you walk away from here and say, well, let me ask some folks what we know about mom's strengths and what she does day to day to keep the kids safe or promote their well-being in the face of the violence. That, if you take those two questions away and start using them in your work, you may find that you're getting different information from the folks you've been working with, whether it's DCP or therapists or, or other people who know the family. Um, and so really what we want to do is, is look at in our work, is the story being told about how the perpetrator's behavior is impacting the kids? And again, from the, the point of view of discussion and documentation, that's much different than saying the family has a history of domestic violence. That, those words tell me nothing about risk and safety, is not fact-based, doesn't give the therapist anything to work with, doesn't give the evaluators anything, doesn't give necessarily the magistrate or the judge anything to work with. The, the words, the couple has a history of domestic violence, doesn't tell me anything meaningful. What you want to think about using is descriptions of, there's a parent in this family that's engaged in a, in a pattern of abuse and control that involves physical assaults over time, gets specific to the degree that makes sense, has included the children in these ways in that, in that abuse, includes threatening to take the kids from her, assaulting her while she's pregnant, interfering with the medical care. I mean, I'm giving you a range of very common behaviors that are often not seen as part of the issue because they're not the physical abuse or the incident that we often focus on. And so when you start changing that language, I often get um, attorneys saying to me, well, I, we, this, this is a great training, Dave, but, but the magistrate's not here, the judges aren't here. Uh, but I'm a firm believer in, yes, get those folks in the room, but also if you're filing motions, if you're putting documentation, you're making an argument in court, you're providing information. On the DCP side, um, I get workers all the time who say, well, this is great, but my supervisor's not in the room, my, my manager. And what I know from experience is starting the conversation about domestic violence issue in a family like this. Well, we've got a case, there's a long history of domestic violence, mom's not leaving or she won't call law enforcement, or she won't get an order of protection, produces a very different result than starting a conversation like this, which is we have a parent, we have a father who's been very violent to mom in front of the kids, has made a series of parenting choices that involve using his kids as part of his abuse of mom. He's interfered with their basic care. And we've got, we have a mom who's engaged in a series of protective behaviors, and we're still concerned about the danger he represents to the, ch to the children. Those two presentations are going to often produce two very different results. The underlying fact pattern is off, is, would be the same in both those cases. I've seen cases uh, presented very uh, differently with the same fact patterns. And in fact, oftentimes, and I know you know this, is you have folks who will say, we'll talk to you one way about a case, and what they write down is very different. Because what they're training and the culture in many systems has been right it through the lens of there's a history of domestic violence, a failure to protect framework with a focus on the, the mothers usually as not doing the right thing. And often the perpetrator's pattern of behavior is invisible. So, so what I'd offer you is in any case that you're working with where domestic violence is a feature of it, is to ask yourself, what do I know exactly about that perpetrator's pattern of behavior? And we were in a, a training yesterday, I was giving a training yesterday, and I worked this process with a, a, a DCP worker. And, you know, what she knew was tremendous 
But to get her actually to say some of the things that she knew about his behavior, including sexual assault and explicit threats to murder mom and the children, I actually had to work to bring that out. Because there's such difficult information that people don't want to say it. Whether it's a client who's been victimized or even a professional, there's this urge to move away from this material and actually soft pedal it. They had fights, they had arguments, they had disagreements. And the explicit nature of the perpetrator pattern-based approach really brings forward and says, are we talking about behaviors? And we're not sticking with, well, he's extremely jealous. We're, stopped, we're, we're taking that information going, how does he show you that he's jealous? What does he do? We're not stopping with, well, he's got a temper problem. What does he do to demonstrate that he's got a temper? Within one minute, if you've got somebody say he's extremely jealous and you say, well, what does he do? And, and they say, he checks my underwear when I come home to see if I had sex with anybody else. That piece of information gives you, that one statement gives you all this information about sexual abuse, violation, and a level of control with just a focus on behaviors. Or if you say, well, he's jealous, he checks my mileage on the car every time I go to the supermarket. You gather information that immediately helps you understand what it's like to, for her to try to parent the kids and go to the grocery store, do a simple routine activity that's about taking care of children with him watching to make sure that she doesn't deviate for a certain route. So what's it like for her to be in the car with kids who are saying, Mom, could you stop at the McDonald's? Could you stop here? When she knows that if she moves off the prescribed route, she's going to get abused or maybe the kids will get abused when she gets home. Without that behavior-specific information, you have a really hard time describing how the perpetrator's behavior is harmful to the children. I'm looking at my time here. I'm going to jump through. Um, one of the key aspects of the model um, is its gender responsive nature. And um, it's something I really wanted to highlight in this um, presentation. You've heard me already um, really refer to the perpetrator as male and the victim, the survivor, as female. And that's for a very specific reason or set of reasons. Um, the model itself is actually gender neutral, behavior, sexual orientation neutral. Its behavioral focus allows you to assess when you have two people presenting or concerns about both people being perpetrators of family abuse. It, it's an extremely useful lens for doing that and, and the simple way you use in that way is you individually ask the question about both people, so you separate them out um, in terms of your thinking, and you ask about both people's pattern of coercive control and actions they've taken to harm the children. You ask about both people separately. You don't ask about the couple's pattern or history. You ask about both people's. And what I can tell you from experience, this is my experience dealing with thousands of cases, is the number of true female perpetrators in heterosexual relationships is extremely low based on that fact-based assessment methodology. And, and what it's also helped us do is identify who the primary aggressor is in same-sex relationships. It's also appropriate let, let us identify when the woman's the aggressor against the male partner. All those things, when I do trainings, we're, we're open to all those possibilities, but what we find is when we use that, and even when people say, well, they're both abusive, Using this methodology based on the facts known, we really come out to what we, what we think is, is most prevalent. The other reason I use the language male perpetrator and female victim is because from data out of the U.S. And, and other contexts, men's violence and women's violence is often very different, and men's violence seems to be more embedded in a pattern of course of control, for one, and creates more injuries. In the U.S., the rates are seven times, seven to one the rates of injury caused by male violence against women versus women's violence against men. And we can use that injury rate as a proxy for control and fear. The other thing, which is, I think goes even deeper on some level, is that, um, and you'll have to tell me if you think this is true, um, that my experience is our human services system, our child protection system, um, which means our mental health system, is, is highly gendered. While statute and policies don't usually make a distinction between men and women, mothers and fathers as parents, that... Um, that in practice, we have very different expectations of mothers and fathers. And so that same visual aid, by the way, you can see how I'm not very creative. Could I use the same visual aid for something else? Um, which now, don't confuse this with before, um, 
it looks the same. But this hand now represents our expectations of mothers. This hand, guess what this represents? Expectations of fathers. When we ask, when we go on home visits, when we meet with parents together, who do we ask if the kids are medically up to date, mothers or fathers? If we expect kids to go to counseling, who do we expect the kids to bring the kids to counseling? Right. If you see a dirty kid, a kid uh, messy, not dirty, uh, clothes, face messed up, who do you expect didn't do their job? If you ask yourself in your community, um, Agencies that serve children and families, do they really serve children and families or do they serve women and children? Right? So you begin to realize that we have such different expectations of mothers and fathers. For me, I can't use the word parent interchangeably because it really actually obscures a critical issue, particularly as it relates to family violence, which is male domestic violence perpetrators are given a pass on their responsibility for what they do to kids because of this. Again, if you can't see the left hand, that's fine, because I think it actually makes my point even, even maybe more strongly, that because of this, we approach these families with a higher expectation. So when he undermines the basic care needs of the kids, what we see is her failure to do her job. When she, in heroic efforts, keeps the kids on track and nurtures them and provides stability and gets them up and to school after she's been abused the night before, and we don't document that as part of her strengths and our focus on the kids, then we're failing because what we're doing is saying, well, she's just the mom. We expect her to do that. So she didn't get, get credit for this as a strength. And what we've done in this world is, is basically say she's protective if she leaves the relationship. Again, going back to the relationship-based focus. She's protective if she calls the cops. She's protective if she gets an a, a, a order of protection, a restraining order. Um, and, and so if she isn't doing those things, then we really dismiss her as not protective and not having strengths, and we wipe out the day-to-day -day care, the day-to-day -day stabilizing, the basic needs met with a partner who's getting violent. So she doesn't get credit for parenting in a foxhole. She gets blamed for not leaving, even when the leaving may actually put herself and the kids at greater physical danger and open them up to more abuse because through unsupervised visits. So we're really boxed in. Our system is really boxed in domestic violence victim and let perpetrators off the hook because he's not held responsible for the when he calls her names in front of the kids. That's a parenting choice. When he loses his job because he chooses to get violent to her, that's a parenting choice. So again, I want you to be thinking about your documentation and, and what you're doing. So the gender responsive nature of this model is extremely important. And, and what we do in terms of practice is we really kind of use the practice and guide it with these um, three principles that keeping kids safe and together with a non-offending parent is in the children's best interest, the child-centered nature of the model that I said at the beginning. And, and safe and together refers to the kids being kept safe and together with that non-offending parent, the domestic violence victim. It's not um, automatically a family reunification model. It's not about keeping kids with the perpetrator. But it's this idea that oftentimes in these families, not always, that it's a domestic violence victim who's, who's doing things to promote their physical safety, help them heal from trauma, and provide stability and nurturance. So again, on a practical level, could you describe, if you're working with or representing a domestic violence victim in family court, could you describe the actions, the behavior, right? So it's a behavior-based model that she's taken to provide for the physical safety. Now, they may not have always been successful. But, but could you describe that when he started assaulting her, and this is a real case, she picked up the baby in the car seat, moved the baby to the other side of the room. So he started an assault in front of an infant in a car seat, was doing it to actually try to get a car because he was driving. He had been drinking. He wanted to take his, the family's car to, to go out again and drink the one family car. So she said, no, don't take our car. We need it for the kid. We need it for the baby. We need it for work. I'm not letting you drive the car drunk. It's not safe for you. He starts assaulting her. Baby's present. She picks up the, the car seat, moves it across the room, and then moves herself away from the car seat as he's assaulting her to get the, pa the baby out of the range of his assault. Could you describe specific actions your client has taken to pr try to make their children safer? Could you describe the specific things they've done to help their kids heal from trauma? Talk to them about the abuse. Maybe send them to a relative so that they have more stability. Help them engage in normal activities. 
Could you describe the stability and nurturance they do, the daily routine? You know, people often look at a victim who is showing up in the sunglasses and going with their kids on a hot day to school and say, look at her, she's in denial. But we don't think through a strength-based approach, which is maybe this is what the kids need and get every day, which is she walks them to school. And so I'm not going to let him take that away from them. And so I've had victims who have said, he's ruined every holiday for the last five years. I will do whatever it takes to comply with what he wants right now so he doesn't ruin Christmas or Easter for my kids so my kids don't have bad memories of holidays for the rest of their life. It would be wrong to label that person a denial. It would actually be a, a crime against her effort to look out for her kids' interests. Could you describe that? And do you know that story about the, the client you're working with? So when you look at this, we're, we're really talking about the strengths she brings to the kids, how partnering with her by learning about these things really can help keep the kids safe, and how we shift the system to focus more on intervening with the perpetrator and holding them responsible through uh, criminal action, through referrals to services, through case plans or court plans that really are focused on behavior change, not just services. Um, one of the big things that we, um, again, I don't have time to talk about very much here, is that men's behavior change programs can be a real integral part of a system of change for um, perpetrators, but they depend on information sharing and a more forensic style model of, of intervention versus a therapeutic style of intervention. So that may promote a question in a few minutes as well. But really, it's very critical to the success of those programs. And then the last thing I'm going to show you before I take a few questions is um, that, that these five critical components, really, when we look at documentation and decision-making around cases, that we look to see if the professionals, the therapists, the child protection workers, the attorneys... Um, and the judges are being provided with this information and have access to it or gathering it if that's the role that they're in. And what that means is on any given case, if you took these five critical components, could you fill in specific behaviors about the perpetrator's pattern? Of course, control against the partner. Not just how many times he was arrested, but what he did. Threats to kill, physical assault, not just physical assault, to be punched in the face, he kicked her while she was pregnant. Could you describe ways he used the kids as weapons or undermined her parenting? Could he, the threats he made to take the kids from her or not provide them with support? Could you describe what she does day to day to keep the kids safe and promote their safety and well-being? Could you tell the story about the perpetrator's behavior, how it's impacted the kids um, in terms of different domains of functioning, not just trauma, but day to day routine, stability? And then could you weave together what's meaningful about the things that are not causal, but culture, socioeconomic status, you know, people be, may be afraid of calling the police, they may be in an immigrant community, there may be issues of literacy, um, all those things that may impact sort of the control the perpetrator represents and um, entrapment that the victim faces. And so when you look at these five critical components, really think about if this was front and center in front of a magistrate or judge, how would they respond to this? And is this what our, um, what our work has looked like at this point? If we provide this to an evaluator or a therapist, if we knew some of this and it came from DCP or someplace else, how would it change the way they work with the family and what they give back to the court? So there's various implications of this. Um, I'm going to stop um, with a little a vignette about something. We had a case that came um, through our, our probate court, a termination of parental rights. One parent was suing against the other parent for the termination of, of, of his rights to the child. And he'd been very abusive to her. She had fled one state and went to another one. And um, he contested um, the, the probate. He contested the, the, the termination of parental rights. And so a, a record was created. Not, there's, those cases don't often have records created. So there was a record created. There was a study done. And the study, the domestic violence consultant who worked for me using the Safe and Together model, evaluated the, the, the DCP records, looked at the history, wrote up a report. The report was entered in, uh, was presented by the social worker to the probate court, and at the trial level, the termination of parental rights was granted. Now, this perpetrator from jail, because he's facing deportation charges, uh, contested the, the, the trial court's ruling, and um, it went all the way to the, our, our appellate court in our state. And the appellate court did a finding upholding the trial court's ruling, but in the ruling, they quoted basically verbatim those five critical components. And they laid it out. You can, and they cited the consultant and said, in, in Bridget Riley's report, Bridget works for me, in her report, 
that um, this is the perpetrator's pattern of behavior and course of control. This is what he did. These are the strengths mom brought forward. This is the impact his behavior had on the kids, and really went through all these, these critical components. And really, a, a page, a page and a half of this ruling was really bringing in these five critical components to, to support their, their decision. And so I really want to kind of bring forward that this has had very significant applications in a, in a court setting. I would love to, to kind of go into more detail, but I want to take some questions. Um, so I know that there's some microphones going around. Um, if this made sense to you, didn't make sense to you, you have a question for me, this is your opportunity. There's one up here. Oh, that's very nice. Does that mean you want to ask a question? Uh, David, could, with your model, could you discuss how it might um, safeguard against the more extreme response cases? We've had some recent Eastern States case, and there's a New York City case over Christmas. Um, can you just describe how the model might um, predict or, gr or safeguard against those sort of extreme response cases? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not thinking about the case you mean from New York in terms of extreme cases, but I'm assuming a, a case has ended in the death of a child or, or serious physical harm to a child. Both of those, yeah. I mean, this is not a magic wand. and It doesn't protect against, you know, sort of doesn't fi create a magic shield. What it offers is, is a, is a um, considered experience base. We're actually getting more data. You'll see in the slides we're actually showing that this model is better at helping identify domestic violence, particularly in the child welfare context, keep kids with domestic violence survivors and not in care, and actually um, it's associated with those things without any repeat maltreatments, increase in repeat maltreatments. Um, so we're getting more and more data on the model and effectiveness in jurisdictions. But, but I think you want to think about it as um, from an assessment, information sharing, collaboration lens that when we're talking about, we're taking time in our precious meetings to focus on her decision making and not talking about the perpetrator and their behaviors, or you're sitting in a meeting and somebody says, well, this family has a history of domestic violence, and you actually don't know what they mean. Domestic violence has become, or family abuse has become jargon at the, from the point of view of its utility in assessing risk and safety to children. It's not until you know the behaviors. So a quick example is I'm sitting in a meeting, substance abuse focused case conference for family, social worker presenting the case, and what she says, oh, there's a history of domestic violence, and I, I talk about this hand wave eye roll thing. You can see I like doing hand gestures and different, different high-tech visual aids. And so, so she did that thing that I see over and over again, which is there's domestic violence in this family, and what I translate it to is, well, they all have this. Let's talk about the real issues we're here to talk about. And, and she said, by the way, it's not that serious anyway. So I raised my hand, you know, there's providers, there's 15 people in the room, precious time, 15 minutes scheduled to do case conferences. And I said, could, could you, I don't know what you mean by domestic violence, can you describe the behaviors you're referring to? And she said really, almost flippantly, not quite, she said, oh, dad tried to strangle mom. That's an example of sort of how some of these cases start sliding under the radar because there's not a discussion about the perpetrator's behavior, pattern or behavior, and people just take statements like there's a history of domestic violence as if it's an assessment of risk and safety, or they know what somebody's talking about. And the truth is, some cases that are labeled domestic violence really are not that dangerous. People are using an arrest as proxy for, oh, this is a domestic violence case. And so you really need to get both um, that in, in the picture. The perpetrator-based pattern helps you um, lower your concern in some cases and raise in other ones. So, so I, I hope that's helpful. Uh, a couple other questions I think we have time for. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, I am loud enough to do this. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. You know, I, you know, you're asking a huge question, and I think there's lots of folks doing prevention work, but as we know, and I, in the U.S. context, prevention work is always given the short shrift. I mean, it's, it's really underfunded. It's, it's under – I mean, so I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to grant that premise. Um, what I'm going to speak to in, in relationship to that, though, is, is that um, we have approached domestic violence perpetrators um, from – 
from the point of view is that we can easily throw them away and just assume they're bad people. And that the truth is that most of them are going to have long-term relationships with their children. They're always going to be the father of those children. And that if we want to be in alliance, the truth is if we want to be in alliance with those children and even the adult survivor, we need to be more thoughtful, not softening our position of violence one bit, but more thoughtful about how we, we think and talk and approach the perpetrator because um, that kid needs to know that it's okay for us to hear from the child that they still love their father. I mean, those of us who work with abuse know this. And that, that some of these perpetrators have the capacity to become better parents and that our work to intervene with them teaches kids the lesson that, that, he, that what he did was wrong, even if he doesn't change. What we know is that when we started creating systems where arrest happens, what victims got out of it, even if it wasn't perfect, was the system pointed the finger at him and said he was wrong. When he's sent to a men's behavior change program versus charges being dismissed, she gets something out of that, that, that on the level of, of, I thought it was my fault, but now the court, the attorneys, child protection is saying he did something wrong. I think we can generalize that to kids as well, that we, when we do these interventions and focus them on the perpetrator, there's multiple advantages to doing it, and not just that we're trying to save every perpetrator. I'm pretty clear from doing the work that there's value in approaching him and him failing and us documenting the failure. From a legal point of view, for sure. Because otherwise, the story we're only telling is about her, her approach to this or not. So that's very important. That's a bigger question. I mean, sort of how, how involved, which way is a big question. Sort of beyond the scope of the, the probably one minute I have to finish. So I don't know if we have a chance for one more question. And then over there, and then we'll stop. <laughs> right. Okay, if you can grab the microphone. I'm worried about them over there. Sorry. I can hear you, but can you repeat your question? Uh, yeah, just generational. If it's been passed down from father right. to father, has there been any studies done with that? What we know is, yes, there have been. What we know is, is and this is important, actually, and I'm, thank you for the opportunity of saying this. We know that kids who grew up in homes with family violence are at greater risk than kids who didn't at repeating the patterns as adults both as perpetrators and victims. And, and this is very important and, most of them don't. And this is, you know, where, you, where statistics really matter and how you, you know, understand both angles of it, is the, the, the risk, the likelihood is greater, but the majority of them don't. So if you take whatever the number is, 5 or 10% is normal for other kids and you double it, that still means 70, 80%. I'm, I'm kind of just giving you examples of percentages. Um, don't turn out that way. And I think it's very important from a family law and a, CP, a DCP perspective to know that these kids aren't doomed. In fact, most of them grow up to actually lead, not repeat the pattern. And we have a, a mistaken understanding about that. So I think it's useful to hold both those things. Yes, it's harmful. It can put them at greater risk. And most, most of these kids won't grow up to be victims and perpetrators themselves. So um, thank you for the opportunity to come and speak with you. I'll be, on, I'll be back this afternoon talking about... Um, Father engagement, I can kind of weave some more stuff together, and I'll be on the panel, Julie. Ethics, so if you have questions that are ethic-related for me, that's great. Thank you very much. <laughs>